And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 is in. All right, welcome back to Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast. I am Russell Brown. Joining me as always, CP Christian Page. My man, CP, how are we doing on this Thursday? Doing great. Just another day closer to some college football. Week zero is like two days away. Tomorrow is my last day of being 27. I am dreading every right. minute of it. That's not good. Um, it's just all downhill from here on out. Um, but, yes, week zero, I can't wait to talk about it. We're going to get into that a little bit later in the show with our game picks for week zero of Miami versus Florida and Hawaii and Arizona. So we will get into that. But Ev, if you've been listening to the show, you've probably noticed that CP and I have been doing a weekly breakdown right now of our top 30 players in college football going into the year. Um, we, we've talked about players like Travis uh, Etney. We've talked about Jabari Zuniga. Uh, we've talked about DeAndre Swift. We've talked about – uh, Bryce Hall, T. Higgins. I mean, the list just continues to go on and on and on. So it's it's been a lot of fun. I'm really curious. I'll, I'll be honest, CP. I was listening to some draft podcasts today, and I was listening to the draft dudes of the draft network, uh, dot com and, and with Kyle Krabs and, and Joe Marino, which is a great podcast. So if you guys have not checked it out, be sure to do so. Um, but I feel like I might be a little bit high on Trey Adams just considering of what – uh, Kyle Krabs was saying of where he has him on his board. Like my, I mean, granted, I have not watched as many players as those guys, but like just in my top 30, I've got Trey Adams at 23. Kyle's got him at 93 overall on his big board. And I'm like, Holy crap, man. Like I, I, I can understand a couple of spot difference, but we're talking 70 freaking spots. And I mean, I guess it all depends on durability because you know, when you're talking about, I mean, any football player in general, but especially an offensive lineman, when you have back issues and knee issues, the future does not look very bright. So I'm sure that heavily factors in. Again, that's why I kept him out of my top 30. But, you know, if you turn on his 2017 tape, he's very, very solid overall. So, I mean, the potential he has just from a physical standpoint is there. But I think when you're looking, I guess, on and off the field in a sense, it's that durability concern going forward. And I think that's going to turn off a lot of teams evaluating him for the next level. I agree. I think that will probably be what happens um, with a, with a, a lot of the, the evaluators out there that watch him. It's just that the, the durability concerns are there and, and they're majors. I mean, it's not like it's something tiny either, but I just thought like off of all the, the 30 players that we were listing and, and just, I think I've, I'm up to like 78 players or something through the summer and which is, I think fairly good, but um it's, it's in that range somewhere. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I'm up in, into that range. And I just thought out of the offensive tackles, he was one of the better ones. And I felt like it was a good spot for him uh, going into the season. Cause I've got high expectations for him because of the reality of everything. But um, let's jump into our guys. Um, also today we'll be doing our conference picks and, and who we think will be in the college football playoff and the national championship game. So a lot's coming at you, but we're going to be doing it efficiently and effectively. So, I mean, CP, I don't know if you want to start us off as we go 19 through 11. Uh, just give me your list from 19 through 11, and then we will uh, kind of wrap about it and see where we're at. All right, sounds good. So at 19, this is kind of one of my uh, summer scouting crushes, Marvin Wilson, the defensive tackle out of Florida State. Number 18, Dylan Moses, shocking, another linebacker out of Alabama. Uh, at 17, LaVisca Chenault, wide receiver out of Colorado. 16, DeAndre Swift, running back out of Georgia. 15, another draft crush of mine this preseason. Alton Robinson, the defensive end out of Syracuse. Number 14, we have our first quarterback come off the board. Tua Tungavailoa, quarterback out of Alabama. Uh, Stanford cornerback, Paulson Adebo. Uh, number 12, Justin Herbert, second quarterback out of Oregon. 
number 11, Christian Fulton, the cornerback out of LSU. I really like that list. Um, give me, give me, give me like something brief on two of those guys. Just yeah. Well, let's go to the two draft crushes. I wrote on them. You can go on cover one.net and I can venture out a little bit of guys that I haven't written on yet, but Marvin Wilson, a balanced athlete. And he kind of played second or third fiddle to DeMarcus Christmas. And I forget the other senior that graduated last year for Florida state. So in a sense, now bear with me here. In a sense, he could be this year's Quinn and Williams, where he was kind of buried on the depth chart. And in the preseason, not a lot of people knew who he was. But Marvin mm-hmm. Wilson was a five-star recruit coming out of high school, similar to Quinn and Williams, four-star pushing five, depending on what recruiting service you look at. So Wilson has a lot of that potential, and I love the dude's motor. He's constantly working his upper and lower body, has some pass rushing elements, shows a solid rip-through move, has a little bit of a swim move as well. And he's super smart against the run and pass play. So he's definitely a guy that I think, you know, as you continue to see Florida State maybe evolve in Willie Taggart's second season, I think Marvin Williams is going to be a focal point of that defensive line. And then Alton Robinson, the defensive end out of Syracuse, super long guy. He has exceptional first step quickness, and I think he gains immediate ground. There's a, a Twitter picture that I had probably last month where before the quarterback, I think they were playing Boston College, Syracuse was, before the quarterback even got the ball in his hands, Robinson was like three yards in the backfield already. Mm -hmm. So he has that length. He has that first step quickness. I think he needs a little fine tuning when it comes to just pass rushing overall and pass rushing moves. Those are two guys on the defensive line that I like a lot this summer. I can't wait to see him against some ACC caliber opponents this year. Completely agree on Alton Robinson. He's got a really fun backstory too um, that really cost him uh, an opportunity to um, play – you know, at one of the bigger uh, schools, and I'm drawing. Oh my God, I'm drawing a Texas A and M. There we go. Yes, I'm like, was it Texas or Texas A and M? And um, but no, he so he could have went to Texas A and M. He basically had like a full ride going, and then uh, an ex girlfriend of him accused him of of stealing her cell phone, and basically he was facing a 20 year second degree bur- burglary charge um, to to face in prison, and then for- fortunately a witness didn't show. Um, to the hearing, so all, all the charges were dismissed. But um, unfortunately, during that process, Kevin Sumlin and the Aggies they went ahead and pulled the offer off the table, and he was left going to a junior college in Oklahoma, got a fresh start, and then turned the heads of a lot of uh, different schools. Oklahoma State was one of them, and then Syracuse was the other school, and he, he chose Syracuse, and it looks to be the right fit. Um, and we actually have one player so far through all of this on the same spot. And that is Alton Robinson at 15. That's exactly where I got him. Um, So I'll go 19 through 11 and at 19 T Higgins wide receiver from Clemson Um, Walker little at 18 offensive tackle from Stanford. Uh, I'll talk briefly about him in a moment. Tyler Johnson wide receiver from Minnesota at 17 Christian Fulton uh, at at 16 cornerback from LSU. Um, When we spoke on Tuesday, I had Bryce Hall up there, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to put on some LSU. Then I watched Fulton on Tuesday night, watched him a little bit last night while I was laying in bed, and I actually fell asleep to it. Um, And then I watched a little bit of his tape today while I was on my lunch break, and I'll tell you what, Christian Fulton is the real deal. I mean, he he is. He is, like, just – he's got some length. He's got the athletic ability, very fluid. Um, I I really like him. So he's at 16 – Alton Robinson, like we mentioned, at 15. Uh, wide receiver from Colorado, uh, LaVisca, Chenault, Sh- um, Julian Okora, edge rusher from Notre Dame at 13. Here we go, the, the big the big one. Uh, oh, my God, walk me through this one, CP. Tyler. By oh, a, what we, we just walked through it. And, I, and uh, I Tyler. Oh, Biotish? my God. Biotish, yes, Biamish. Tyler Biamish. Um, no, Tyler Biotish from Wisconsin, um, and then Andrew Thomas, offensive tackle uh, from Georgia. I will say Walker Little at 18, I think that's a w- really good spot for him. I actually like this interior offensive line group a lot. Um, you have Tyler Biotish, you have Walker Little, who I think is more of a guard. 
Um, he's listed at left tackle. I think they have him at left tackle mainly because they don't have anybody else. He does a pretty good job for being a guy that I think can play a little sloppy at times. His base is sometimes a little out of whack. His, his hand placement can get a little crazy. But he does a good enough job with what he has. But I think his, his transition is going to be much easier inside to guard, probably left guard for whatever team selects him. But I like Walker Little a great deal. And then I think Tyler Johnson at 17 is probably a little bit of a surprise to people. But he's very explosive. I think he's a really complete receiver just with his route running ability. Um, and, and then he's got you know pretty strong hands. Again, what he can do after the catch, I really like him. I think the, the pro comp of Stephon Diggs is very fitting for him. And I, I really like him. So at 17 is, is a great spot for him, in my opinion. So uh, that's 19 through 11 for me, as well as for CP. I don't know if you have any objections to what I have, but um, if you're ready to roll, you can go ahead 10 through one. Yeah, we'll probably get to it in a second. But Andrew Thomas, offense tackle, George is a little lower on your board than I expected him to be. I know he was a guy that you really appreciated when we talked a couple months ago. But uh, I'm interested to see because he's very high on my board. So we'll get into that in just a second. Well, I mean, I like him a great deal. Don't get me wrong. He's very clean. I, 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 I like much of his game. But I think the 10 players I have in front of him just make them, I don't know, maybe a little bit more of an impact. Maybe I could move one guy around. But um, I'm just very much on brand with the guy that I have at eight. So, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I have a feeling because I think he comes in at seven for me. So we'll go ahead and get to it. So now, number 10. Henry Ruggs, wide receiver out of Alabama. At number nine, Creed Humphrey, the center out of Oklahoma. Number eight, Tyler, Tyler Biotish, the center out of Wisconsin. At seven, one of your favorite players, Tristan Wirfs, offensive tackle out of Iowa. At number six, A.J. Epineza, the defensive end out of Iowa. At number five, we have Chase Young, the defensive end out of Ohio State. And then we have our SEC run. At number four, Grant Delpit, safety out of LSU. Andrew Thomas, offensive tackle out of Georgia at number three. At number two, we got Derek Brown, defensive tip, tackle out of Auburn. And at number one, I said it a few months ago, he's one of my favorite players in college football, Jerry Judy, the wide receiver out of Alabama. So Alabama has two wide receivers in the top ten and the SEC and, and, some, and, and the Big Ten. They're pretty loaded as, as far as draft prospect goes this year. I really like it, and I, I like Henry Ruggs in there. Um, I did not give him top 30 love. Um, which is maybe just a poor effort on my part. But I, I just fell in love with guys like T. Higgins and Jalen Rager and, and Tyler Johnson that, to be honest, I kind of forgot about Henry Ruggs a little bit, but not like in a, in a bad way. But like it was just like I like these guys a little bit more. But he's he's a very talented player, no doubt about it. Um, do you, did, you, did you say Raekwon Davis at all? No. No, I'm still not super impressed with Raekwon Davis. I think he's failed to really – maximize his potential and now maybe you know I was talking about kind of Quentin Williams and Marvin Wilson being buried in that depth chart but Raekwon Davis was like the guy coming into the season last year he got overshadowed by a couple guys on defense so I think he's kind of continually putting together so I, he would still make my top 50 list but I still think there's a lot of untapped potential there that he hasn't really got to yet I would agree with that and that is the the guy number 10 on my board so uh, maybe that's a little high compared to where Andrew Thomas is and every, everything else. But I like Raekwon Davis. I, I think he's got power, strength, and sure, he doesn't uh, – it's almost like he's like Deshaun Hand in a way, like all that potential and just not like really – That's fair. It. Yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, and I'm not saying like, oh, because they're Alabama guys, but like, no, I, I think that's pretty fair. Just a, a lot of power, a lot of strength, and, and the athletic ability. But Davis just is not really meeting it. But I, I think just with the potential, it's there. And I, I think he can really turn the corner this year um, – for Alabama. So he's number 10th on my board. Uh, Alabama as well is, is at nine. Dylan Moses, linebacker. I think he's just a phenomenal player. I love how instinctive he is. He's, he's fantastic uh, against the run. He does a good job. Super, super quick and gets, gets to the ball so fast. Oh, my. Yes. It's, it's incredible, man. His change of direction. It's just he's very good laterally. He's just he's an all around good player. Um, and maybe nine's a little low for him just to uh, how good he is. Uh, number eight. I've been a huge fan of him since I ever first laid my eyes on him. C.D. Lamb, wide receiver from Oklahoma. He's just 
he, he catches everything. He might not be the fastest guy in the world. There might be some questions on the route tree just because of what Oklahoma runs. But overall, I think he's just so talented. It would not surprise me by any means if a team – and I know it's only August, but I, it would not surprise me if he was a top 10, top 15 pick in the draft. Um, Justin Herbert at seven. I like Herbert a lot, but I just don't um, – my biggest question mark is just the, the durability. Can he stay healthy? He's had the shoulder issues – can, can he stay healthy? And then it's really working through progressions. There are times that he gets stuck staring down initial reads and only that read. So seven is still a very good spot for him. I think maybe some people are expecting him to be probably in the top three, maybe even top five, but at seven is where he's at. Grant Delpit safety from LSU. Um, AJ Epineza is number five for me, edge rusher out of Iowa. Your boy, Derek Brown, D tackle Auburn at four, two was at three. Um, Chase Young's two, and then Jerry Judy is number one from Alabama. Just a complete player, great route runner. Um, and I, I think that's uh, a pretty top ten right there, if I do say so myself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and Jerry Judy, like, you know, it, it seems like every year, you know, there's a receiver that kind of threatens the top echelon of players. But Jerry Judy, I mean, as a freshman, we knew it's like this guy's going to be a top five pick. Oh, yeah. Matter. I mean, it was just immediately when he stepped on the field because – what does like when you you know you kind of make your t chart? I talk about the t chart all the time when you're uh, doing player evaluation, especially when you finalize some reports. You know you're he's going to have a heavy heavy dose of positives in that left side, but then the negatives, I don't know what to put there because he plays bigger than his size. He's super fast. You talked about his route running ability. He catches nearly everything. He plays in a very translatable offense. So it's really hard to really red mark all over his report because. There's not much really that he needs to clean up. And of course, every player in college making that next step can clean things up. But it's kind of similar to what Saquon Barkley was at Penn State. What more can he do to really solidify that top guy in the in the 2020 class? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, I mean, I, I think no doubt Chase Young is just the, the one guy that could probably test Jerry Judy. But other than that, I, I don't see a, another player better than Jerry Judy in this class. Um, and then – there's still a ton of names that we haven't gotten into. I mean, there's players from the Big Ten still that we need to talk about, and we will get to those guys. I mean, Joe Bocci from Michigan State, Kenny Willekes from, from Michigan State, uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones from Michigan. Um, um, what's his name? Malik Harrison, I believe his name is, the linebacker from Ohio State. He's another guy that's I think could be under the radar a little bit. Patty Fisher from, from Northwestern, Bryson Tompkins. Uh, or Hopkins from, from Purdue, tight end number one. Um, I mean, there's so many different names that we will be getting into, but uh, I, I think these top 30 lists that we have are, are very good, thorough, and complete. So congrats, my man, on your top 30. Um, Thank you very much. I look forward to the written content of it that I think you said you'll be working on. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to put that on the docket for Monday morning, so kind of get a refresher of college football and then wake up and you'll have the whole – Top 30, maybe top 40, just depends on how lucky I'm feeling, how healthy I'm feeling about writing more. But uh, we'll get that to start the, I guess, the official week one college football of next week. I like the week zero moniker. That's really funny. It is. It's, I mean, it's very common, I think. Have you never heard that before? No. Well, like, I felt like when I hear it, it's a joke, but it sounds like it's, like, legit. Like, it's called week zero because – it's kind of the start, but not really because you only get, you know, a handful of games, in this case two on Saturday. But I kind of like it. So I, I, it sounds like it's, it's going to stick for a while. I'm just excited for college game day, the theme song to play. I wish it was the old college game day song, but either way, you kind of get like that, that music in the background. You get Reese Davis going. You got Lee Corso acting like he's got the – well, I don't want to say it, but he's acting insane. And then you've got Kirk Street just going crazy about Ohio State. Desmond Howard acting like Michigan's the best team on the planet. It's great. It's awesome. Every single show. Every show. He thinks they're untouchable. Like, dude, you're not doing the Heisman in 1990 anymore. Relax. But um, anyways, let's get to our conference picks. And uh, let's run through the conferences briefly, talk about everything. I don't know what conference you want to start with. I have a conference in mind that I would like to start with, but if you want to get it going, I'm more than willing to follow your lead. No, you go ahead. You got one on your mind. Let's go for it. Yeah, well, let's start with the ACC. Uh, let's start at the beginning of the alphabet, like proper adults here. And um, Clemson is no doubt the favorite, and I'm cool with it. I mean, they've got Trevor Lawrence. They've got T. Higgins. They've got Travis Etney. They've got uh, an incredible amount of 
talent all the way across the board. Isaiah Simmons on the defense. Now, they did lose some talent on that defensive line. They lost their entire starting defensive line. But they are still very talented, and I'm excited to see what they do. I think as long as they have Trevor Lawrence, they've got an opportunity to compete for a national championship, but in reality, just compete in the ACC. Now, they might be a 10-2, and 11-1 football team, or they very well could be a 12-0 and 0 team. So I got them winning the ACC, but can I just give you a sleeper? And that sleeper, and they might not be a sleeper, but they were 10-3 and 3 last year, and that's Syracuse. I think Syracuse, if the quarterback situation – goes correctly, and if it is Tommy DeVito, the sophomore, if he's the guy that they they go and play, I mean, they don't have Eric Dungy anymore, but if that's their guy, I think with Alton Robinson and and the ability that they have with, with Mo Neal, the senior running back, and just everything that they can do, I think that they have very much of a chance to – compete and and maybe not just go 10 and 2 like they did last or 10 and 3 like they did last year but maybe be an 11 and 1 football team now that's very tough to do but their non-conference schedule is western michigan at liberty at maryland western michigan holy cross and i think that those are four winnable games they've got to beat clemson but they're at home for that one and they played them pretty tight last year they've got to go to nc state they got pittsburgh they got to go to florida state Boston College, at Duke, at Louisville, and then Wake Forest. So I think it's a very winnable schedule. I'm not saying it's a great schedule, but I think that's a team that can very much compete in the ACC. I'm not sold on Florida State. I'm not sold on Georgia Tech. I'm not sold on NC State right now. Um, They don't have my boy Ryan Finley anymore. Um, So uh, really the only other team I can think of that could really compete, um, maybe Miami because of some of the players they have on defense, but – maybe Boston College. Other than that, it's Clemson or Syracuse, in my opinion. So I'm going Clemson. Yeah, I mean, the ACC, it's Clemson and a bunch of everybody else because there's there's not – it just seems like – I don't necessarily say a lack of talent, but just the lack of consistency among all the programs. You know, ever since Lamar Jackson left Louisville, they've taken a step back. And you had the the very brief Mark Rick stint in Miami. That didn't work out. Jimbo Fisher ran its course at Florida State. So it's just a lot of turnover, but – I think obviously the most consistent team is Clemson and nobody's stopping them. So quickly, yeah, I'll say they're my favorite as well. But I'm glad you brought up Syracuse because I think Dino Babers, the head coach there, is one of the most underrated coaches in all of college football because the guy has rebuilt a team. I mean, Syracuse has had some winning tradition maybe back in the early 2000s, late 90s, but nothing to the point where we're talking about them being a potential sleeper to kind of crack – that top 15 on a consistent basis and talking about guys like Alton Robinson being a defensive end. They got a guy that's eligible next year, plays free safety, Andre Cisco. He is a, he has so much range, so quick, seven picks last year. The guy's a stud. We'll talk about him next year at this time. But I think Syracuse, just the foundation of that and just the, the chemistry or the, the confidence that Babers has instilled in that program. I'm completely on board with you. It's Clemson, a bunch of everybody else, but I think Syracuse, is kind of that next team that could really kind of surprise. Because there's always that one team in college football. Syracuse could be it. They surprised last year, but now I think they'll have to see if they can sustain that. And like you said, if they get that quarterback position figured out, they could be. They could definitely be a threat to some teams. They're not a threat to win the, tit- uh, the ACC title. They're definitely a threat to maybe make Clemson start rethinking their, their Syracuse. Yeah, make Clemson sweat a little bit. That's all I'm asking them to do. That's just just do that a little bit. I want to see a little change, and I'd, I'd be okay with Syracuse doing it. So um, Clemson for both of us. Let's go Big Ten. Um, I'll start this one off. I think Ohio State. I think that's the obvious choice. Um, they are very, very talented. We all know that. The, the quarterback um, – Justin Fields replacing Dwayne Haskins. That's the big question mark. And Ryan Day is the head coach. But this is a team that's bringing back nine starters on defense. We talked about this on the last show about that defensive line. You know, Chase Young, don't sleep on Jonathan Cooper. Um, But overall, I really like Ohio State as the favorite in in that conference. I would be biased if I said Michigan State. I think this is the year for Michigan State that if they were to do it, it's got to be now because they bring back so much talent on defense. They have a veteran quarterback who is their captain. He's a senior. Um, The run game will be shaky if they can't figure that out, who's running the football. But 
I'm hoping that they can, but uh, Cody White's a really good receiver for them. And it's, I think they'll be okay, but it, it just depends on which way the, the ball uh, lands in some games and in certain situations, like against Michigan and Ohio State. And if it, if it lands in their favor, then they could catch a break and they could be okay. Um, but I, I'll go with Ohio State. And I just, I think with uh, five road games, seven home games, I, I think this is a team that can very well go 11 and 1, 12 and 0. So OSU for me on the Big Ten. Yeah, I wish I could be different, but I can't. Until there's a team that really comes up in the Big Ten and legitimately threatens Ohio State on a consistent basis, they're going to be my pick every year, regardless if Urban Meyer's at the helm or not. And and maybe I change my mind next year at this time and the Ryan Day experience doesn't work, but they kind of have instilled. I mean, it's Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State. It doesn't matter what kind of personnel losses from the on-the-field perspective or among the coaching staff. They just retool every single year. They plug-and-play type players. And there's just not – I mean, if there's any drop-off, it's they're not winning by 25 points. They're winning by 18 instead. So there's not much of a drop-off when it comes to those top echelon programs. Ohio State, sure, they may take a step back with Dwayne Haskins not being the quarterback. Justin Fields just did that learning curve. Of course, the head coach situation. But overall, they're just too talented. Again, I'm not buying into Michigan quite yet. You were saying, you know, Michigan State, a heavy, you know, a heavy laden senior class coming back for them. That helps when you have experience at quarterback. I know there's a couple teams that people like to really hop on the bandwagon with Northwestern, Nebraska, and maybe Wisconsin. But Stop let's it. be real, guys. It ain't happening. But sure. <laughs> Iowa, sure. If you want to go win eight or nine games by all means, but you're not even touching the playoff. Well, they, they came close, and then uh, L.J. Scott reached over the goal line. It was awesome. Um, let's go SEC. I'll let you lead this off. This is your con- conference. This is your country. Uh, give me something, Auburn. Come on. Uh, I wish I could. I mean, I guess there's a little more parity in this league because Georgia has the talent. They have the coaching staff, I think, to somewhat threaten Alabama because, you know, they bring back Jake Fromm, DeAndre Swift, two guys that we've talked about. Best offensive tackle in college football, in my opinion, Andrew Thomas. So going forward, they have a lot of strong candidates to put them into that SC championship game. I think they're going to get there. I think Florida's still a step behind, especially when you're talking about Felipe Franks, a quarterback. I think Dan Mullen's going to have that program rocking and rolling soon. But I think, it's, of course, it's Alabama's to lose. We talked about pretty much everybody in the receiver class is going to be drafted. They're going to have 12 or 13 players picked. Again, I mean, that's just – that's an every-year thing. We talked about defensively. They've had some personnel losses, but they just rebuild every single year. And, of course, with Nick Saban's there, they're always going to be the favorite. I wish Auburn could contend in that way because there's a lot of talent on that defense, especially that defensive line. You talked about Nick Coe in last episode – or the episode before then. We talked about Derek Brown today. Marlon Davidson's another guy there. I have some playmakers in the secondary – all in all, but the schedule is just rough. I mean, yes. uh, playing Alabama and Georgia going to Gainesville, having to open with Oregon, going uh, to Texas A&M. There's just a lot, there's too much there, especially when you start a freshman quarterback. I think A&M, from a talent perspective, is really solid, but not enough. Their schedule is also very brutal. If they're out of conference. they got to go to Death Valley and play Clemson, though they held it close in College Station last year. I think all in all, it's Alabama, Georgia. I'm still going to say Alabama wins this one and gets to another playoff. I agree. Uh, I mean, Alabama, the last three years, they're 23 and one over the last 10 years. They're 71 and nine. Um, Nick, Nick Saban is an absolute maniac and he finds ways to get the most out of his guys, whether they're five-star recruits or three-star recruits. And it, it doesn't really matter. He's a terrific coach. They've got a terrific amount of talent there. And it's just a football factory. So don't bet against Alabama. I would like to go Auburn. I really would. Um, War Eagle. But like you mentioned, the the schedule, that's just brutal, man. Oregon, A&M, Florida, LSU on the road. Um, They still got to play Bama and Georgia. Fortunately, those are at home. But they have maybe the toughest schedule in college football. Um, And if if one guy goes down, it's going to be tough. And we we mentioned Bo Nix on the last show. Can can he – play through all of that adversity maybe he can if he if he does hell yeah but I just I don't see that happening unfortunately I think Florida's a bit of a sleeper because they're they're stuck behind Georgia which makes sense I mean Georgia's incredibly talented um, like you said but Florida I think 
you know, and you, you brought this up. I think Dan Mullen's doing a really good job. Felipe Franks is the difference maker, in my opinion. But C.J. Henderson on the defense, Zuniga's on the defense. Well, Michael P. Ryan's back this year, and I think he's very underrated. He's getting no love in the preseason from all the running backs. Um, I mean, I get it, like Najee Harris and Swift and stuff, and even like Keyshawn Vaughn, but like, I, I think he's better than Lynn Bow or uh, Scotty Phillips from Ole Miss and, and uh, Kylan Hill from Mississippi State. I think he's better than quite a few of those other guys that's listed in front of him, like as third team All Americans and stuff like that. So um, he's returning. I, I think he's very talented, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was like a 1,200 to 1,500 yard rusher this year, um, as long as Franks isn't doing stupid stuff and throwing the ball out of bounds. But uh, either way, Alabama and the SEC. Um, which one you want to do next, Big 12 or Pac-12? Which one are you feeling? I'll go Pac-12 quick because I know you want to talk about probably your champion of the league over there. But I'm going to go with Oregon. Whether they get the, the season opening win against Auburn at all, but I think their schedule matches up with them really well. I mean, they got to go to Palo Alto and play Stanford. Stanford, K.J. Costello, solid quarterback. They have a couple players on the offensive line. You talked about Walker Little today. But I think overall, I mean, they, again, they do have to go to Seattle and play Washington. But I think Oregon – when you return 10 starters on offense, and that 11th starter was Dylan Mitchell, who declared early. But you bring in Jawan Johnson, the wide receiver from Penn State. You essentially return 11 starters. Troy Dye on the back end, or at the linebacking core on defense. He's a stud guy that probably just missed both of our top 30s. So I think going forward, Oregon has the personnel to really push the envelope and get back to their winning ways in the Pac-12. But I will leave it up to you because I know exactly who you're going to pick. And I don't necessarily disagree because I love their defense. I mean, yeah, Jawan Johnson's there in Oregon, but he's not any good, CP. He's just not good, so <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, no, I look, I'm going Utah. Their defense is very, very good. Um, the Pac-12 is just a fun conference to watch, and I get it. Oregon's got Herbert, and uh, there's a ton of talent there, but I I really think Utah could be a team that is is – I don't want to say like underrated, but maybe a little bit overlooked because of Oregon. You have Washington, you even have Washington State, um, and and there's still some slappies out there that like Clay Hel Clay Hel Clay Helton in USC, um, which I don't know why he shouldn't even be there, but it is what it is. Um, but I, I I like Utah a lot. Zach Moss is there. They've got an incredibly talented defense. And if you got Zach Moss, I think you got a shot to win football games, especially if he's healthy. Uh, I, I think they've got a favorable schedule. Um, at BYU is a little tough to start the year. Uh, at USC is a little tough. But they've got to go to Oregon State, which is a win. At Washington, we'll see. At Arizona, I think that'll be fine. Um, but other than that, it's all home games, and I think they're winnable games. Um, so again, Utah for me with that defense of Tupai, Fotu, uh, Pensini and, and Anai on the defensive line. And then like we mentioned, uh, Burgess and Blackman, Jalen Johnson in the secondary, they got a lot of talent. Manny Bowen as well is, is no slack at linebackers. So, um, they run a four, two, five, which is a lot of fun. Um, so I, I like them a lot. Tyler Huntley can sling the football. If he can stay healthy, he's going to be fine. And again, I like Utah, so give me give me the Utes, and uh, I don't even know what they say. Do they get, do they say go Utes, fire up Utes? What do they say? Go Utes, probably go Utes. But let's go. I'm not uh, sure. I'm not sure. That's a that's a good question. But uh, Big Twelve, and that will do it. And maybe I'll, uh, yeah, just go Big Twelve. That's fine. I want to pick Texas so bad. Sam. I want to buy in. I think I bought in. I love Sam Sam Ellinger. I don't know how he's going to translate as an NFL quarterback. But the guy has uh, all the grit in the world. He's going to stand in, take many hits just to deliver, you know, a screen pass for all that matters. Love Colin Johnson on the outside. They have a couple offensive linemen I like too. But, again, kind of with Ohio State, until somebody threatens Oklahoma in the Big 12, I'm going to keep going with them. They reload every single year. Jalen Hurts comes over with that winning mentality from Alabama. I know they essentially lost their whole offensive line outside of Creed Humphrey. But if we learn something from Oklahoma – they kind of retool that offensive line every single year as well. So I think with Lincoln Riley there again, Jalen Hurts, a very adaptable offense for him. It kind of probably said more than uh, Brian Bull's offense was at Alabama. Uh, so I think going forward, Oklahoma, they're again the team to be. I haven't even looked at their schedule. I don't even care to. I think it's a very minimal league. So I think going forward, Oklahoma, they're the team to be until a team legitimately threatens them. 
Texas threatens them in the headlines, but they're not threatening them on the field quite yet. And I know the win loss over the past few years, Texas has got a couple of them. But I think overall, when you're just from game one to game 12, it's Oklahoma for me. I will say this. Texas is a team that I'm, I'm very much like on the edge like you are, but they lost a ton of talent on the defense. I cannot buy into them. I like Ellinger. I, I, I like uh, Devin Duvernay, the wide receiver, as well as Colin Johnson, the wide receiver. Zach Shackelford is no slack uh, at, at center. I think he's a pretty good interior offensive lineman. Isn't great, but is not terrible by any means. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off the grid here. I, 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 as hard as it is to pick against Oklahoma, I'm going to do it. it like, I, I think Oklahoma will probably be the team because I've been wrong about the Big 12, I think, like five consecutive years in a row now. Um, so I'm going to roll with TCU. I'm going with TCU. They were 7-6 and six last year, but they had, I want to say, like the second or third most injuries in college football this past year. They bring back seven starters on offense, and they've been the number one Big 12 defense, I think, like, um, I don't know, like the last six. Probably ever since Patterson's been there. I mean, that's his bread and butter. Yeah, no, they, they have a great defense, and – it's – let me see. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a stat on that. I'm sorry. But either way, Gary Patterson's been a, a defensive guru for them. Um, now, they do got to go to Oklahoma. They do got to go to OK State. They do got to play Texas Tech. Um, and Iowa State on the road October 5th is going to be uh, certainly a game that I, I think could maybe be like the, one of the, the, the beginnings of the upsets – um, on a on a Saturday afternoon, but I, I just I like TCU, the SMU, Kansas, um, Arkansas, Pine Bluff. That's that should be three wins. Purdue at Purdue, they should they should win that game. Um, I think they got speed. Jalen Rager's there. I I like this team a lot, and I, I I'm gonna and I, maybe part of it's because Gary Patterson smashed the follow button on Twitter with me, so it could be that I don't know. Oh, yeah, a little fun fact of the day, but. Uh, yeah, no, we're going to go TCU. Let, let's screw it. We'll do that. And um, that's, that's who I'm rolling with. So TCU is going to be my surprise. And uh, so I've got Ohio State, Clemson, Bama, TCU, and Utah. Who do you got? Uh, Oklahoma in the Big 12, Oregon in the Pac-12, Bama in the SEC, Ohio State in the Big 10, and Clemson in the ACC. And so with those five teams, do we think Notre Dame has a shot at all competing in – the independence to make a run at anything during the regular season. Yeah. I mean, I think they definitely have a shot, but now, I mean, their track record just isn't good when they have to match up against, you know, the likes of Clemson and Alabama or whoever it may be. So, um, yeah, I don't, unless they run the table, if they, even if they slip up one time, then they're, they're probably outside looking in on that playoff picture. Well, and I will say this, they've, got to go to Louisville which is should be no problem but they got to go to Georgia they've got to still play USC they've got to play Virginia who I think I think Virginia could be sneaky out of the ACC a little bit not like not like Syracuse but whatever they got to go to Michigan and they got to end the year at Stanford so um oh and they got to oh they got to play Duke off a bye and this is oh wow this is four consecutive weeks they got to play Virginia Tech off a bye at Duke off Duke's bye Navy off a of bye, and then Boston College off a of bye. So oh, wow. best, best of luck to them on that. Um, but, I mean, Notre Dame, sure, they could be like 10-2. and two. I don't think they'll be a playoff team. But who would be your four playoff teams? I'll go both from the SEC, Alabama and Georgia. And then I'm going to go Clemson and Ohio State. I know, very generic. And then as, as of right now, you know, I know Clemson – they lost some defensive linemen there, but as long as that receiving core, Travis Etienne and Trevor Lawrence, and a few pieces on that offensive line, I mean, their defense is, it's not going to be bad, but they're going to have to retool a little bit. But I think Clemson's still the team to beat in college football. You said Travis Etienne, and this whole time on the show, I've been saying Etni, and you've been letting I just, I, I just let it go. I just let it go now. Stop. Stop letting me butcher things. I have to go on radio shows. You know this, and I'm going to sound like an idiot. Um, <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> Those are your playoff teams. Mine are going to be uh, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State. And the toss-up would be either add a, a, an SEC team like a, like a Georgia or a Florida 
but I'm not going to do that. I could add TCU, but I did this last year. I added Texas and I got burnt. So I'm going to go Utah and let's have some fun. Let's put a Pac-12 team in this, please. Let's have some fun and let's do Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, Utah, because one, I would love to watch Utah versus Ohio State and I would love to watch Bama versus Clemson and then the national championship would be the winners of that. Um, What would be your national championship game? I think it'd be – it's hard. I mean, it just depends on how it lines up. But I think Alabama and Clemson would be the top two teams. So, I think they're, you know, number one seed, number two seed. I think they'd probably win their first-round game. So, I think it would be Clemson and Alabama once again. Oh, my God, no. Like, no. I don't want it. But, uh, I mean, it's it's good football. But to be honest, you were talking about listening to the draft dudes with Kyle and Joe the other day. It was funny because they were making jokes about how many times they had to watch – the national championship game last year and Dude. just Clemson Alabama play over the years because on both of those teams I mean there was probably 20 plus players drafted so how many times you got to go back to that game it's a nice resource because you, you only have to watch one game uh, because both but are all the players are in there but still all in all I do, I'm tired of seeing Clemson and Alabama play if they play again, I'm just going to study the game so much that I'm going to be repeating the plays back like Sean McVay does. I'm just, like that. That's dude. I think I watched that game like nine or ten times this past year, just in itself. I don't want to. I don't want to keep doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that's probably the way to go. Alabama, Clemson. If I'm picking a team, though, I, I think out of my list, I would go Alabama, Ohio State. And I would go Alabama wins. So that's going to be my pick for the national championship. Bama, you just don't bet against them. Maybe Clemson figures it out. But I think just with the talent they lost on that defensive line, I think that's going to make a big difference. Not having a guy like Cleveland Farrell anymore, um, uh, Christian Wilkins. Yeah, Christian Wilkins was the glue of that D-line. He's, yeah. he, that's going to be a noticeable loss for them, at least early in the season. I think it will. I think it will. And maybe maybe if they do lose a game like uh, Syracuse, um, maybe they can recover – uh, fast enough to where they can hold on and go 11 and one, win the ACC still, and then make it still. But uh, we'll see. Um, but we do have week zero picks to get to real fast. Uh, this is Saturday, August 24th, your boy's 28th birthday. Miami, Florida um, versus Florida. I was saying Miami versus Florida, but I didn't say the versus part. But either way, in Orlando, 7 p.m. starts. So that's nice. You got your whole day to mow the lawn, wash the car. Uh, do the the honeydew list for the wife, whatever it is. But participate in the fantasy football draft. There you go. I got a kid scrimmage to coach. I got to really figure out that eight nine year olds don't know the difference between your post foot and your set foot. But it is what it is. Um, Miami and Florida, the eighth ranked Florida Gators. You wrote the preview. It will probably drop tomorrow. Who do you think is going to win this thing? What's your picks here? Yeah, I, I think it's Florida pretty easily. And and we talked about it. You said you hit it right on the head. I think Florida's season is defined by Felipe Franks at quarterback. I mean, he has all the physical ability in the world, but between the ears and can he just be consistent? And I think that's probably what keeps Dan Mullen up at night because he knows he has the talent around him. They're going to have to, you know, address the, the offensive line. Juan Taylor, Martez, Ivy, no longer there. Uh, but defensively, I think this the, this team is fine. You talked about Jabari Zanuga. Uh, you know, there's a couple linebackers here and there, some players in the secondary. I think this Florida team, just based on – I mean, they won 10 games last year, and it kind of just went, flew under the radar. I mean, yeah. they weren't sexy wins by any means. But in year one, it's Dan Mullins, the head coach from Florida, has really been struggling over the years just to string out any consistency. I think that's job well done. So, I think going forward, uh, you know, it just depends on the shoulders of Felipe Franks how far this Florida team can go. But with Miami, you know, they're breaking in a new quarterback. Uh, there's some pieces on offense. They have really strong receivers, but I think there's some pieces on offense that need to really connect the dots and come together. But defensively, I think they can hang in there. So I think they're going to give uh, Felipe Franks a lot of struggles. Shaq Quarterman, Michael Pinckney at linebacker are really the studs. They've been there forever, it seems like. There's yes. a couple of players on the Miami defensive line as well that are going to get some NFL looks. So, yeah, look for the preview tomorrow morning. Uh, and, and yeah, I'll have you covered for the top, top draft prospects to look out for in that game. I, I, I dig it. You, you just literally hit every name that I was going to say. Uh, well, Michael P. Ryan, certainly on, on the brand here for me. But um, I, I like Florida to win this game. I just 
nothing against Miami, but I, I'm, I'm not sold on the quarterback that they took. I'm not sold on the quarterback that they benched. It doesn't really matter. But uh, I, I, I do like their linebackers, Quarterman and Pinkney. I forgot about them. I thought they were going pro, um, and they ended up staying, which is nice, but I thought they were gone. So, like, to see those guys back is, is key. But I just I, – I don't know. I think Miami could be – fraudulent I think there's probably people out there that are thinking they could be back and going 10 and 2 or whatever I I don't see that I I could see them at best like an 8 and 4 football team this year um so I like Florida did you give a pick did you say Florida yeah yeah okay okay so then we got Arizona Hawaii at Hawaii um this will be a fun game I don't think this is going to be an easy game for Arizona by any means Hawaii um Cole McDonald it's the show for him I I, I truly think this could be a guy that – I don't want to say is like, you know, Jordan Love kind of came out of nowhere, right? I think this could be the same thing. Cole McDonald not necessarily like comes out of nowhere, but it wouldn't surprise me if we talk about more of Cole McDonald um, sooner rather than later. But Arizona is the team – that I, I like in this matchup simply because of J.J. Taylor, Khalil Tate. I think Khalil Tate being healthy is is really key because he's been dinged up over the last couple of seasons. And really last year was, was the year that it was like, okay, this guy's not right. Like it's very clear, very evident that he's got some issues. Um, I, I, I think Arizona – on the road, man, it, I wish I knew the spread of this game. I guess I should probably have looked that up. But it, it's probably going to be a high-scoring game. I mean, we could literally see five points – or five points um, – like five or six touchdowns from each team. Uh, so, Arizona for me is the team I'm going with. I don't know about you, but uh, that that's the team I'm rolling with. Yeah, I'm going to go with Arizona. And, I mean, I hate to be kind of part of the stereotype, but anytime you know, you have the – the power five conferences going over, you know, to a mid majors, I forget what they're called group of five group of five in college football, then you're going to favor a little more with those, those power five players, those power five teams. So, cause you went in the trenches. I always define a lot of games when you're talking about, you know, especially those out of conference games, I think the games are won in the trenches. So I think all four Arizona probably has the advantage in that regard, but I just, yeah, I mean, with, with Kevin Sumlin, the Kevin, <laughs> the, uh, uh, Tate experience, Khalil Tate experience last year. I just wonder what's in the offense, you know, what's in store this year? You know, can they ride the coattails of J.J. Taylor and go forward there? But, uh, yeah, I will be intrigued just to watch this game from Cole McDonald's standpoint. You know, there's a lot of hype. I have not laid eyes on him whatsoever. All I know is some highlight tapes on Twitter. So uh, I'll be really excited to see him in a primetime situation and not have to sit there and, you know, muddy through, you know, ESPN – 12 to go find Hawaii football. So it'll be nice to see them in the limelight, even though if it is on CBS sports network, whatever it may be, it'll be good to see. I think a lot of people will get, will be very impressed with him at least as far as who I've talked to. So I'm really looking forward to this game from a matchup standpoint, but I think Arizona gets the W. Yeah. It's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a competitive game. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Cole, uh, there's Cole McDonald, who's he's got size too. He's he's not like some small, like little scrambly quarterback. He's six four, two oh five. He uh, completed fifty nine percent of his passes last year. He had thirty six touchdowns to ten interceptions. But Hawaii's bringing back nine offensive starters and nine defensive starters. Um, Tavai's a guy that they lost on defense, but I mean they've got a, a guy like uh, Solomon Matue. Why do I say these stupid? Like why do I say these names that I can never pronounce? But Either way, he's. Their, I ask myself that every time on the podcast. I'm like, well, come on, CP, why do you do that? Um, but either he he come he comes back with 92 tackles. He's a senior. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some Hawaii players in the Senior Bowl, um, and as uh, another two players as well, Colin Colin Schooler from Arizona. Uh, he's their leading tackler. He had 119 tackles last year and 18 tackles for loss, which is ridiculous. Um, and then Cody Creason, offensive guard. Um, he's a, he's a versatile player. He's a player to watch out for. Um, so yeah, no, it's going to be a fun game. I can't wait to watch it. So both of us go in Arizona, both of us go in Florida CP, you got anything else to add to the show, my man, man, I think we, we covered a lot there. So, uh, yeah, I guess definitely just check out, you know, preview articles for those two games coming, mm-hmm. hopefully tomorrow, that being Friday morning. And then my top 30 big board, hopefully will debut Monday morning, Monday afternoon as well. So, that's on the docket for me. If you got anything else, go for it. 
Um, well, obviously, you guys just need to head over to CoverOne.net. You need to go to your app store, download Cover One, the app. Just download it for free. It's very easy. Get the push notifications. While, while you're browsing through, you can check out one of my recent articles on Texas A&M wide receivers, uh, Kendrick Rogers. He's a, he's a very talented receiver. I went over the entire trio that they have there, but uh, the Aggies have maybe one of the most underrated uh, receiving trio groups in um, college football other things I'm working on, I'm going to be working on a preview tonight on Arizona, Hawaii. I'm going to put this podcast together. That will drop on the Cover One uh, website tomorrow morning for everybody to listen to. But um, it'll it'll be a lot of fun for all of that. Of course, smash the follow button at Russ NFL Draft at underscore Christian Page. And then if you guys want more of these podcasts, here's what you need to do. You actually need to help us out. You need to go to our podcast, whether you find it on iTunes or in your podcast app or on Spreaker.com, you need to subscribe to the show and then you need to rate the show. And I don't need you to give me a five star. You give me your honest opinion on the show, but either way, rate, subscribe, give us these reviews so we can pump out more content because you will be helping us allow you or allow us to help you either way, uh, rate, subscribe, review, all that good stuff. So CP, Thank you, my man, for joining me on a Thursday evening. Um, well, I guess Thursday night now. But uh, either way, thank you for joining me, my man. Uh, enjoy week zero. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll talk to you guys all next week.